So we will get just a little bit into long-term financial planning, and then we will stop for the day. Okay, so in finance, remember long-term means anything more than one year. And in fact, this long-term financial planning that we're going to be talking about is just about planning for the next year. So we're not going, this isn't a five-year plan, a three-year plan. This is just planning for next year. Now, financial planning, a lot of people uh, would assume that as a finance guy, I think finance should be leading the discussion here, but that's not the case. Financial planning is actually near the tail end of the activities. The first thing that happens is strategic planning. And so what we do is we get managers together from all the different operations, all the different divisions, all the different groups, and we're going to uh, make decisions about future product and service directions for the firm. Now, who kicks off the strategic planning process? Do I have any marketing people in here? You guys kick off the strategic planning process, and here's why. The marketing people are, in theory, out there looking around. They understand where the opportunities are in the market. They understand which part of the markets are diminishing. And they bring that information to us. And they say, you know, what would be really great is if we could provide a smartphone that also was a breathalyzer. Because then, you know, people would know they're driving home drunk, something like that. You know, they come up with new ideas for products. They see where the opportunity is, and they bring that up. Okay, so marketing's going to bring that up. Now, sometimes marketing will say things like, you know what I really like is a smartphone that you could like roll it up to where it was like the size of a cigarette and you just tuck it in your shirt. Wouldn't that be great? And this is where the engineers come in and they talk about technical feasibility. And they're like, yeah, you know, technically that is doable, but each one of those phones would cost like $10,000. How many people are willing to spend $10,000 on a phone that may well fall into the toilet, right? And so uh, that's engineering's there to make a sanity call. But I will tell you this, do you think engineers would love to work on something like that? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh my goodness, engineers love to tinker with things, right? And so engineers, uh, a lot of times they would say, yeah, yeah, we could do that. And uh, then the uh, accounting and procurement people weigh in. And the engineers say, oh, yeah, we could do that. Now, the whole thing will have to be plated with a thin film of gold, right? In order to make the conductivity, we're going to have to use gold. And what do the procurement people say about gold? By the way, what's procurement? Purchasing? What do, what do you guys know about gold? Is it cheap? No, the procurement people are like, what? The raw materials alone are going to cost $5,000, right? And so maybe they call an end to the insanity, uh, and maybe it's um, accounting that figures out that the kind of labor that's going to go into that is going to cost way too much. And so accounting and procurement basically then have to provide that cost information based on the engineering input. And then after we have all this information, the managers are going to decide which existing products should have their production level raised, which new products we should introduce, and what products we should get rid of. I'll tell you one quick story here about getting rid of a product. We made uh, plastic additives for PVC, polyvinyl chloride. PVC is very brittle, and you have to put plasticizer in it to make it work. And these uh, camping bottles, well, we don't have any in here, but the camping bottles, yeah, I like that one back there. Did you hold up your teal blue? Yeah. So, oh no, that's not plastic. Okay, so uh, the, the clear ones, those used to be made out of PVC. And then scientists figured out that those plasticizers were getting into the water and creating an estrogen mimic. What is estrogen? Female hormone, Female hormone right? Now, estrogen mimic, probably not a bad deal for women, but when the men started developing breasts, that's when they said, whoa, we got to stop this, right? What do you think happened to the market for additives for PVC after that? Right? Luckily, we were able to switch over that machinery and use it on a new product, which I'll tell you about next time.
Okay, last time we were talking about long-term financial planning. And we had talked about the strategic plan, and I think we got down to the part where we were talking about which um, products should have their production levels raised and which should have their production levels lowered. And I told you about something that could happen that would make a product less attractive. Remember the story about PVC and the plasticizers? Um, so I'm actually going to tell you about the strategic planning at this company where I was at. But first, let's talk about this last bullet point. And that is that if we increase sales, we might require additional assets. For example, if you're a car company and you are producing every single car you possibly can and you want to grow your sales by 10%, you have to build new factories in order to do that. You have to build new factories in order to do that. And so that's what that last bullet point is about. And so basically, it's, we're gonna take from the strategic planning process this forecasted increase in sales, and we're going to use that to help determine uh, what percentage increase we need in our assets, and then we're going to talk about how we're going to fund those assets. So we're talking about both the capital budgeting question and the capital structure question. So let me tell you a little bit about Americam. We were a family-owned company. We did color concentrates, and I was in consumer packaging. I told you about my prescription vial, uh, but we had other businesses. We had businesses focused on PVC, primarily vinyl siding, but we were also making those colors for the, the camping bottles that were causing the problems. Uh, we were also in the business of making the color concentrate that goes into the parts of the dashboard of your car. And a lot of people don't realize that the plastics on the inside of your car, oh, for sham, she's late. The color or the plastics that are inside your car are different kinds of plastic and different kinds of plastic really hard to get them to look the same. And so that's one thing we were really good at was figuring out how to make the airbag cover look just like the dashboard. So that was our thing. Now we primarily supplied, in fact solely supplied American car companies. We did not supply any of the, the Asian car companies or German car companies. This was about the time that the SUV took off. And at the time, the only people really making SUVs were American car companies. And so we were able to ride this wave. And so when we went to our strategic planning process, one of the things the marketing people told us is, this SUV craze is gonna be really big. We need to ramp up our ability to make color concentrates for automotive interiors. And this is the same meeting where they told us about the PVC water bottles causing problems for men. So, it was cool. What we figured out was the same equipment. Oh, for shame, he's late. So, the, the, uh, the cool thing was the same equipment we were using to produce the PVC concentrates could be used to produce the automotive concentrates. So, we didn't have to totally buy new assets to do that. We could dedicate some of those assets we've been using for PVC now to use that for the car interior parts. So, that's just a little snippet of what that looks like inside the firm. Oh, and by the way, who told us that the equipment could be used for, uh, one versus the other, it was the engineering people, right? We said that they're part of the strategic planning process. So now let's talk about the financial plan. The financial plan is going to follow the strategic plan. So the strategic plan is all about where sales are going to go up and down, and the, uh, then we talk about the assets that we're going to need for that. So once we've figured out the assets we're going to need, now we need the financial plan. How are we going to fund these assets? And we have three ways to fund new assets. We have internal equity. By the way, where does internal equity come from? It's the addition to retained earnings. Remember at the firm, when they make money, that money can flow to two places. And we're going to use the accounting terms here. So we've got net income, and it's going to flow to one of two places. It's going to flow to dividends, and it's going to flow to the addition to retained earnings. 
And in fact, we're going to see that net income is equal to these two things added together. And so any money that we earn that we had not paid out in dividends can be thrown into this addition to retained earnings. And if you remember on the balance sheet, the accumulated retained earnings belong to the shareholders. Therefore, they are equity. And so any money that goes into addition to retained earnings is internal equity. And then, of course, we could also issue shares. That would be external equity. We could issue shares. And then finally, we could issue debt. We could borrow money from the bank. We could issue bonds. Now, notice I've got external in parentheses there. All debt is external. All debt is external. Don't ever let anyone tell you there's such a thing as internal debt. We have a conglomerate here in town called SRC, Springfield Remanufacturing Company Corporate. I forget. Now, it's a great company, but they had this interesting structure. They've got the mothership, and then they've got all of these little divisions all over town, and they all do different things. Of course, they're all making good money, but they all do different things. Now, these individual div uh, divisions, the employees of them say, oh, well, we have internal debt. We have internal debt because we borrow from the mothership. And I say, no. That money you are borrowing from the mothership is either the mothership's internal equity or it's money that they are raising externally. They're either issuing additional shares. I don't even think they're publicly traded. But they could go out and borrow money at the bank or issue bonds. And so basically that money is not internal debt. There is no such thing. So don't let people fool you on that. Questions? By the way, is it possible for addition to retained earnings to be negative? Yeah. 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 If you pay out more dividends than you have in net income, then your addition to retained earnings will be negative. By the way, why would I go ahead and pay out? I'm just assuming I'm going to keep paying the same dividends here and they just happen to be less than that income. Why would I do that? Any ideas? Okay, so the shareholders are expecting a dividend. By the way, legally we don't owe them a dividend, right? But they're expecting a dividend. If we cut, if we cut the dividend, what signal does it send to the investing community? Not doing well, stock price drops. Yeah, we're not doing well. If we go ahead, though, and pay the dividend, in spite of the fact that it falls below our net income, we're sending a very powerful signal that our troubles are temporary, right? Our troubles are temporary. We see, you know, next quarter not going to be a problem, so we're going to go ahead and pay the dividend. That's a very strong signal. So that's why people might do that. Okay, so we're going to assume, though, and for our cases, that addition to retained earnings is positive, and that is our internal equity. So here is our simple model. First of all, we're going to start with the sales growth from the strategic plan. By the way, this is an excellent question for an exam. What is the starting point of long-term financial planning? What is the starting point of long-term financial planning? And it'll either be the sales forecast or the forecasted sales growth. It's going to be something like that is the correct answer. Remember, financial planning happens at the end, not at the beginning. We're going to start out by assuming that our assets are currently at full capacity. If I'm a car manufacturer, I can't make another single car without adding an additional factory. If I'm a soap manufacturer, I can't make another unit of soap without building another factory. If I am a web uh, hosting company, I can't host another single website without adding another server, something like that. Okay, now we're going to relax that assumption later, but that's where we're going to start. And then we are also going to assume that our assets will grow at the same rate as sales. This is a basic assumption. And I'm going to tell you why it's perhaps not a good one, but it's the best one we've got. And here's why. Think about it this. If you've got four car factories, and those car factories are all running at 100%, and then we have a 10% increase in our sales 
Uh, will we add 10% assets? No, we're probably going to end up adding 25%. Why? Because we're going to build another factory, right? And so we're, we're only having 10% increase in our sales, but we'll probably have to expand our assets by 25%. Now, we assume that our sales will continue to grow and that capacity will eventually become utilized. So that would be one issue that would keep our assets from growing at the same rate as our sales. Also, if it wasn't fully utilized, but we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so after we assume that the assets are gonna grow at the same rate of sales, we're going to determine the new level of assets necessary to support those sales. So we've got our new level of assets, we've got our old level of assets. So we know what that change is that we're going to have to fund. And remember, we said there were three ways we can fund this. Internal equity, external equity, and debt. So we are going to first determine the addition to retained earnings in the new scenario. And we're going to take that as our source of internal equity. And then we are going to figure out the remainder so we've got this change in the assets. We're going to subtract out that internal equity, and what's left there must be raised externally. What's left must be raised externally. And we actually have a name for that. It is EFN. And remember, external financing needed. We have two different ways we can raise money outside the firm. What are they? Issue debt. Issue debt or shares, right? Issue, so we can borrow from a bank, uh, issue bonds, or we could um, issue new shares for external equity. So basically, it's uh, issuing shares or borrowing money. Those are our two sources for externally. Now, we need to determine how much of that external financing is going to be raised as debt, how much is going to be raised as equity, uh, what's, what's the mixture of those things. And we are going to have to either make some assumptions or put some constraints on the situation in order for us to be able to answer that last bullet point. How much <clears throat> should we raise from each of those sources? <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to show you perhaps the simplest uh, income statement and balance sheet you've ever seen. Over here on the income statement, by the way, this is our current situation. Our current situation is this. We have sales of 1,000. We have costs of 800. Uh, and by the way, the cost is like everything you subtract out. Uh, we have net income of 200. And remember, net income flows to two places, dividends and addition to retained earnings. Here we're told we're going to pay dividends of 100. 200 net income minus 100 in dividends says we've got 100 in addition to retained earnings under the current situation, and that's where we get our internal equity. Now over here on the balance sheet, we've got assets of 500. And how are we financing them? We're financing them with 250 in debt and 250 in equity. Now I want you to notice that debt plus equity has to equal assets and that's going to be true throughout everything that we do here. And in fact if you don't, uh, it becomes no longer a balance sheet, it's an unbalanced sheet. We don't want that. And then the final tidbit that we have to have in order to move forward is that our forecasted growth rate for next year is 20%. Our forecasted growth rate for next year is 20%. And so our sales, we're going to assume that our sales grow by 20%. We're also going to assume that our assets grow by 20%. Now, if I tell you that something's going to increase by 20%, it's the same as saying we're going to multiply that thing times 1.2. And here's why. Because that really means in the future we're going to have 120% of our current value, and if you divide that by 100%, then you get 1.2. So don't let that freak you out. Here we go. First of all, let's work this income statement over. We assume that the sales grow by 20%. We're going to multiply by 1.2, and that's going to give me my new sales level of $1,200. Now, we have an implicit assumption here. Look at this, we're growing the costs at the same rate as the sales. 
And the implicit assumption here is that our profit margin is constant. Our profit margin is constant. Now, do you think in reality that profit margins would be constant as you grow? Probably not, and here's why. Because we have a combination of fixed costs and variable costs. We know that those variable costs will grow at the same rate as the sales, but the fixed costs likely will not. And so if we wanted to be a little more um, sophisticated about this, we would be looking at both variable costs and fixed costs. When you get out in the real world and you're doing this kind of thing, you're actually going to be looking at every single expense category. And you're going to be asking yourself, would a 20% increase in sales increase this account? And if so, by how much? The variable costs are easy, right? Because you know they're going to grow at the same rate of sales. But what about your travel budget? Who knows, right? You've got to think through these things and you look at prior history to find out. Okay, so now we know that our costs, 800 times 1.2 is uh, 960. And so if we take 1200 minus 960, we're going to get 240. Because of our assumption of uh, constant non-changing profit margin, we could have also just taken the old net income multiplied by 1.2 and got 200. Okay, so far nothing has been said about dividends or addition to retained earnings, uh, but that is what we're doing to our income statement. And by the way, uh, we're just in, as soon as we figure out what we're going to do with dividends, we'll be able to figure out that addition to retained earnings, which is our internal equity. So what do we do next? Well, we, we've made the assumption that the assets have to grow at the same rate as sales. And so I'm going to take 500 times 1.2, and when I do that, it's going to take me from 500 in assets up to 600 in assets. In other words, I need another 100 in assets. I haven't said anything yet about how we're going to pay for this, but I do know that we do need an extra 100 in assets because we assume the assets grow at the same rate as the sales. But here's the problem. Check out our balance sheet. Is it a balanced sheet? No, it's an unbalanced sheet. So we've got to do something to fix that. We know that the debt plus equity has to be equal to the total assets. So we know that that 600 has to be on both sides. So we've got this extra 100 in assets. We've got to raise 100 extra over here in the debt and equity. We don't know yet how much of each we're going to have to do that, but we know that we're going to have to add 100 in debt plus equity. We've been given an assumption, though, and the first assumption is that we're going to grow while maintaining a constant debt to equity ratio. The original debt to equity ratio was 250 divided by 250, which is how much? One, right? In other words, if we want to maintain that, those two numbers have to be equal. So two numbers that add together to equal 600 would be 300 and 300, right? Does that make sense? Of course, we could also have just taken 250 times 1.2 and done that for both of them. So either, you know, however you can get this math to work for you and work for you in your head, feel free. Okay, now what does that mean? It means I need an extra 50 in equity, going from 250 to 300. I need an extra 50 in debt, going from 250 to 300. Where am I going to get that extra 50 in equity? Retained. Yeah, retained earnings. Now, there's two ways to get, you're absolutely right, there are two ways to get uh, equity. Number one is internal equity. Number two is going out and selling shares. Let me tell you why we prefer to use internal equity. Whenever I go out and issue new shares or new bonds, I have to pay something called flotation costs to investment bankers. Now, if you ever hear the term investment banker, you probably picture someone in your head that makes a lot of money. And they do. 
Where does the money come from? Flotation costs. Do I want to pay those flotation costs if I don't have to? Absolutely not. And so I'm always going to start using my internal equity first. And then if I have to go out and issue shares, I only want to issue the minimum amount that I need to cover this new equity that I, that I need for my, my capital structure. Okay, so that 50 is going to come from that 240 that we have in net income. So 240 minus the 50 in addition to retained earnings tells us that we have to pay out dividends of 190. Now, that dividends here is what we call a plug variable. A plug variable is a variable that you let float to make the other math come out. Am I ever going to ask you to identify a plug variable? No. Should you start off with the goal of identifying the plug variable? No. You will figure it out as you go along. For instance, here, we knew we had 240 in net income. We knew we needed 50 of that to go into our equity. What's left over? 190. That's how we figure out how much to pay in dividends. Okay, so that takes care of the equity. And then we have to go outside and raise the 50 in debt. We have to go outside and raise the 50 in debt. So our external financing needed for this um, example is only 50 because we've got that internal equity. The only money we had to raise outside was the debt. Any questions so far? Why don't we just pay 100 in dividends like we did last year, then fund it all with retained earnings? Oh, very good. Remember that we started off with the assumption that we need to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio. And if we had done that, now we would have 250 in debt, 350 in equity. 250 divided by 350 would not be one. Now let's ask about this assumption of maintaining a constant debt to equity ratio. It may sound, well, why would they do that? And the answer is this. For every industry out there, there is an optimal capital, uh, optimal debt to equity ratio, an optimal capital structure. If we are already at the optimal structure, we're going to make it our goal to stay at that. And so this is a very common assumption to make that we're going to try to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio. Does that answer your question? Very good. Okay, so that's just example number one. <clears throat> Now we're going to we're going to relax that assumption of constant debt to equity, but we're going to say, well, hey, we're going to grow while paying out no dividend. We're going to grow while paying out no dividend. Well, if I'm paying out no dividend, that means all that money flows into addition to retained earnings. And that becomes my new internal equity that I can add on to my existing equity. And so now we have 490 in equity. Now, what does that mean must be true about the debt? Yeah, 600 minus 490, it's got to be 110, right? Now, if I have 110 in debt, I start off with 250 in debt, and now I've got 110 in debt, what must have happened? You old friend, $250. And now you owe them 110. What must you have done? You must have paid off your debt of 100 and or how much? Yeah, I've lost track of my own thoughts here. Okay, so the point is you must have paid down the debt, right? And so we're going from 250 down to 110. We must have paid off 140 in debt. And so in this case, the external financing needed is actually negative. It's actually negative because we're paying off debt. And so the correct answer for external financing needed here would be minus 140, and that's all in debt. Now, will our debt to equity ratio be the same? Absolutely not. No way it can be. So we're going to have 110 in a debt and 490 in equity. That's going to be way different than what we started out with. Questions? Okay. Now we're going to make a different assumption. 
we're going to grow while maintaining a constant dividend payout ratio. Now, we're relaxing all those other assumptions we've already done, but let's talk about what is the dividend payout ratio. It is dividends over net income. That is your dividend payout ratio. Dividends over net income. And so we are going to assume, uh, basically, previously, we were paying out 50% of our net income as dividends. So that means we need to pay out 50% now. What's 50% of 240? 120. 120. And what's that going to leave for us in addition to retained earnings? Also 120. And so that's how we're going to figure out uh, we've got our addition to retained earnings of 120. We know that that is going to be new equity. So now all I need to do is add that to my existing equity of 250. So I've got 250 plus 120 in addition to retained earnings. Now we have 370 in equity. If I have 600 in assets and 370 in equity, what must the debt level be? Yeah, it's got to be 230, right? Because 230 plus 370 is 600. Now, what did we start off with for debt? We started off with 250. And now we're telling ourselves we've got to have 230. What do we have to do in order to get from 250 down to 230? Yeah, you got to pay off, pay 20 in debt off, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to use 20 in cash to pay that off. In this case, uh, the plug variable is going to be the debt. And in fact, it was in the last case too. But once again, I'm never going to ask you to figure out what the plug variable is. Okay, were we able to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio? No. Uh, but that wasn't, wasn't our driving assumption here. By the way, do you think some companies actually seek to maintain a constant dividend payout ratio? Yeah, a while back, I forget how many years ago it's been, but I saw the head of Daimler-Benz being interviewed. What does Daimler-Benz make? I'll give you a hint, Benz. Cars. Yeah, they make cars, Mercedes, right? Okay, they actually had a goal of keeping a constant dividend payout ratio. And the head of uh, Daimler-Benz was on CNBC, and he was being interviewed by this young lady, I think she was probably fresh out of college, and she said, uh, I see that you are, your net income is negative for this quarter, and he said, yes. And she said, are you hoping to maintain your constant dividend payout ratio? And he just laughed at her. Why is that a stupid question? If your dividend payout ratio is 50% and you lose $100 million, how much does your dividend have to be? It's actually going to be zero. But in order to make the math come out, it would have to be negative 50, right? Can you pay a negative dividend? No. no. And so that's why it was such a stupid question for this person to ask was because that's impossible to do. Your dividends can never be less than zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so there are companies that do make this their goal, so it's not, not too far out of reality. Now let's talk about what happens. Sometimes students are like, wait a minute, if you pay out that 20 in cash, now your assets are gonna go down by 20, and you'll only have 580, and that's not acceptable. And the answer is no, you're wrong, and here's why. If we had not paid off that uh, extra 20 in debt, we would now have debt plus equity of 620. And where would that extra, that extra 20 is gonna show up in our assets too, right? And it's just gonna show up in the cash account. And so that's why you shouldn't let yourself be fooled into thinking that paying out that money is going to mess things up. Things will be messed up if we don't pay out the money. Questions? Uh, 
Okay, now, oh my goodness, we're getting kind of hairy here. We're going to try to main, uh, we're going to pay a set dividend and maintain a constant debt to equity ratio. So we're trying to accomplish two constraints at once. By the way, at some point, you can't keep adding constraints and still get an answer, right? And that's why we've always got the plug variable. You always have to have one thing that floats. And if you put in so many constraints that nothing floats, then you can't solve the problem. But here we go. So we're going to pay a set dividend, and we are told we're going to pay 200 in dividends. And we are going to maintain that constant debt to equity ratio. So if I pay 200 in dividends, how much is left over for addition to retained earnings? 40. Ms. Lee, you're so sleepy today. Did you stay up last night? Yeah. Yes. Oh. We won't ask her what she was doing. You were what? Preparing for, this Preparing for this class. Okay, so let's talk about why that's a bad idea to make yourself so tired preparing for a class that you can't stay awake through it, right? Do you see that you need to do some balancing in your life? Okay, very good. Okay, now we know we're going to have 40 in addition to retained earnings. Where is that going to add on to? The equity. But we also know if we're going to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio that the equity has to be 300 when we get done. If we take our original 250 and we add our addition to retained earnings of 40, that brings us up to 290. Brings us up to 290. How am I going to get that extra 10 in equity to bring it up to 300? What am I going to do? Ms. Wynn. Yeah, we're going to issue shares, right? And so we have to issue $10 worth of shares, and we also have to borrow 50, right? And so what's our total <coughs> external financing needed? It's going to be 60. It's going to be 50 in debt and 10 in equity. Questions so far? OK. Now, we're going to start relaxing some of our earlier assumptions. And one of those is that our current, we're going to say our current sales were not at full capacity, that we're actually at less than full capacity. So we're told we're running at 90% of full capacity. So what does that mean? It means that our, our sales are equal to 90% times full capacity, so we can actually rearrange that to figure out what is full capacity. Our current sales are 100. If we divide by that fraction of the full capacity used, the 0.90, we end up with 1,111.1111. By the way, it just goes on forever. That's going to be our full capacity. So in theory, I could increase my production by 111.11111 without any additional assets whatsoever. And that would be taking me from that 90% full capacity level all the way up to 100%. Now, 111.111 is not enough to meet our needs. Because remember, our sales are going to grow by 20%. They're going to be 120 now. So what does that mean? It means that I have to have additional assets to take care of that 120 minus 111.11111. So how do I figure out how much my, I actually need? Well, we can say that 1,200 uh, minus 1,111.11, that tells us how much, how many more units we could make or how many more dollars of sales we could produce. And then we're going to divide that by our full capacity. Now notice here it says 1.08. Go ahead and scratch through that one. It should just be 0.08. Scratch through. Yeah. Ask you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if I had not subtracted the 111.1111, it would be 1.08. But if I subtract that out, it tells us that we're going to have an 8% increase. So that means I need to increase my assets by 8% to meet the new sales level and take myself up to full capacity. 8% of 500 is 40. So it means my new assets are going to be 540. 
In the new scenario, what does my debt and equity have to add together to be? 540, right? 540. So from here on, we would treat everything just the same. Now, I'm going to tell you that it's smart to keep some slack capacity. If we're currently at 90%, we probably, uh, unless we've had a downtime, we probably need to stay about there. And here's why. There are reasons we should keep spare capacity. First of all, to recover from errors. If you are running at 100% full capacity and you mess up one item, can you now meet your promises to your customers? No way. There's no way for us to make up for a screw up. And by the way, do you think people screw up? Oh yeah. If you don't, if you don't know that to be true, just go, just, just spend some more time with people, right? You'll, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Okay, number two, recovering from breakdowns. Not only do people screw up, Machines get screwed up too. I had a machine, it was in the Nevada Machining Center, and oh my goodness, that thing broke down all the time. What a pain in the butt. And as a result, uh, and, and everything that I made, some part of it had to go through the Nevada Machining Center. And so if I had booked myself up at 100% capacity on the Nagata Machining Center, there would be no way that I would ever be able to meet all my promises to my customers simply because that machine was down about 30% of the time. Oh, I hated that day. Okay, and then finally, to take on surprise orders. Let me tell you about the product that I was making. It was a safety valve. It looked kind of like a marker, and it would go down inside of the oil well, down below the surface level, where when uh, you know Iraqi tanks or whatever roll over and shear the wellheads off, then the oil doesn't come spurting out of the ground. And we would, uh, by the way, United States law requires for all of the offshore oil projects here in the United States to have one of these valves. Now, I wasn't the only person making these, but there were only two or three companies that made these kinds of valves. And so what would happen is we would get a call from someone in the Gulf of Mexico, and they would say, oh, wow, we forgot to order this valve. You can't finish the well without the valve. My valves usually went for around $100,000 a piece. Now, here's what you need to know about rig rental time. So the oil rig is out there working on the well. Every day it's out there, and these are 1997 prices, so I'm sure it's much higher now. But every day out there was a quarter million dollars just to rent the rig. That's not talking about paying the workers. That's not talking about feeding the workers. That's not talking about all the things that you've got to do to keep an oil rig afloat out in the Gulf of Mexico. And so when someone would call me and let me know that they had screwed up, do you think I had some leverage to charge them a higher price? Yeah, if I could save them one day, if I could save them one day, uh, it was worth $250,000 to them. So here I am with a valve that I would normally sell to people for $100,000, and they would call and they'd say, how much to get that in a week? What do you think I told them? Uh, I'm not that bad. So 300000 right? I would sell it for 300000 You know, I'm making, I was making good money before. I am making way good money now, right? If, though, I had been operating at full capacity, would I have been able to take on those orders? No way. No way I could have done it, right? Okay, so I'm going to tell you, you probably don't want to take things up to full capacity. And the second thing I'm going to tell you is, if we make the assumption that we're going to maintain the same percentage of full capacity that we have now, then we can treat it as if everything was full capacity from the beginning because the fractions, the things just cancel out. And so uh, what I'm telling you is, if you're just gonna maintain the same percentage of full capacity, then you can treat it just like all those first examples that we've worked. You don't have to worry about 
of this uh, figuring out how much extra capacity you need over your full capacity. Well, just, but in reality, how would you go about figuring out what your slack should be? Usually history. So, uh, I was running at 80%, I was meeting all my customer orders. I'm now running at 85% and I'm missing some opportunities. I'm probably running too much, too high. So it's one of those things, and I know no, uh, students don't like to hear that experience and history count, but if you've been around in something for a while, you know, oh, we don't ever want to go above 85%. Now, is that going to be different based on different places? Yeah. And another thing is this, uh, can you work to make that number higher? Absolutely, you could. I have, in fact, he's, he's a good friend, he's a former student, and uh, he and I uh, were talking about his, he was running, basically running a factory, and we were talking about something called a bottleneck in his operation. A bottleneck is a machine that everything has to pass through, and it's got the lowest capacity and so he was telling me about this bottleneck that he had. And as a result, he was not able to run as close to full capacity as he would have wanted. And I said, well, why don't you go out and buy another one of those machines? And you can set them in parallel with each other. By the way, the problem was breakdowns, right? It was another piece of crap machine. But if you've got two of those pieces of crap, do you think it's possible that you might be able to run at a higher percentage of full capacity? Yeah. And so we can work on it over time, but without changing our, our equipment layout and all that, it, you're going to go with history. Good question. Other questions? Did you know it was possible to hate a machine? If you've ever had a piece of crap car, you know where I'm coming from, right? Okay. Now, let's talk about what is the uh, problem solving method here. By the way, there's not a neat slick equation. I guess the best equation you could come up with is uh, new assets minus um, internal equity equal external financing needed. That would be about the best you could do. What I recommend to you is to have a process. You start out with the, the forecast sales growth and you increase both the sales and the cost by the same proportion. And then that's where that assumption of constant profit margin comes in. We note our capacity utilization and then things like our dividend policy and our capital structure policy. So a dividend payout policy would be we're going to continue to pay out the same dividend payout ratio or we're going to pay out 100 in dividends. Uh, capital structure policy would be something like we're going to maintain a constant debt to equity. Then we're going to figure out our percentage increase in assets needed to support the new sales level. And we're going to consider the capacity utilization uh, if, if we're trying to go to full capacity. But once again, I'm advising you not to do that. And then we're going to find the external financing needed by subtracting our old debt, old equity, and uh, new internal equity from the, total, the new total assets. Another way you could think of that is to just take the new assets. So in this case, it would be 600 minus 500. The new assets are... Uh, the extra assets are 100, and we're going to subtract out the addition to retained earnings, and that would give us our external financing needed. And then finally, we use our capital structure complaint, con constraint to figure out how much of that's going to be in debt and how much of that is going to be in equity. And in some of these uh, examples, we didn't have a capital structure constraint. Notice there were like two of them where we didn't constrain the capital structure. And so in that case, basically, uh, the other constraints dictated to us what our ending debt and equity were going to be. That is basically it. Now, I have walked you through that. And the reason I walked you through that is I want you to have a semblance of how this works. In reality, it's going to be much more complex than that. We're going to be looking at multiple accounts. And uh, I will tell you that if I have questions on an exam about this, uh, probably will not be too complex. And in fact, you could go out and look at the exam one practice 
And if you perchance saw that there were no external financing needed questions in that exam one calculation practice, you might take that as a hint as to how much weight I'm going to put on this in the exam. Did you guys catch that hint? Yes. Okay, very good. Now let's talk about something that I can guarantee you will be on the exam. And that's the idea of a couple of different growth rates that we talk about. We talk about the internal growth rate, and we define that as how fast the company can grow based on internal equity alone. In other words, we're funding all the new assets from addition to retained earnings. Now keep in mind that we're still assuming that assets and sales grow at the same rate. So when I say how fast you can grow the company, I mean how fast you can grow your sales, how fast you can grow your assets. And the other one is the sustainable growth rate. And that tells us how fast a company can grow on internal equity and the right amount of debt to keep the debt to equity ratio the same. So for example, let's talk about our earlier example where we had a debt to equity ratio of one. If I have a dollar in addition to retained earnings, I can go out and borrow another dollar and keep my debt to equity ratio the same. Now compare that, that means I've got two dollars in new assets I could buy. Compare that to a company that has no debt in its capital structure. That company is only going to be able to grow assets by a dollar for every dollar in uh, addition to retained earnings. And in fact, uh, this is a good thing to write down. For an all equity firm, the internal growth rate is identical to the sustainable growth rate. For an all equity firm, the internal growth rate is equal to the sustainable growth rate because we have no debt in the capital structure. <clears throat> okay, what, let's see, what else can I tell you? Uh, can you grow faster than the sustainable growth rate? Yeah, you absolutely can. And in fact, that's why companies go public, right? They go public so they can grow at faster than the sustainable growth rate. And so if you look at startups, they're typically growing faster than the sustainable growth rate because they're out there issuing additional equity. Does that make sense? Okay, so these are just two growth rates that we, we like to think about, kind of two benchmark growth rates. And here is our formula for internal growth rate, or IGR. What does ROA stand for? Return on assets. We remember that from our previous discussions. Then I'm going to introduce you to a new variable here, B, which is the retention ratio or plowback ratio. Retention ratio or plowback ratio. We have two names for it. Retention ratio makes a lot of sense. It is just the addition to retained earnings divided by net income. This is what percentage of the net income is being retained. What percentage of the net income is being retained? That's B. That's why we call it the retention ratio. Now, what about the plowback ratio? I'm guessing not many of you grew up on a farm like I did, but I can tell you this. When you get through harvesting the crop, there's all this stuff that's left in the field. And what does the farmer do? we plow it back into the dirt. What does it do after you plow it back into the dirt? It what? Fertilizes the soil? Yeah, it fertilizes the soil. And what does that do to our potential for growth? It increases it, right? And so that's why we call this the plow back ratio. It's the money we're plowing back into the firm to facilitate future growth. Okay, you should have both of those names on your uh, formula sheet. You should have both of those names on your formula sheet because who knows how I'm going to refer to it on the exam. And one other thing that you need to know is occasionally I will not give you the plowback ratio. I'll give you the dividend payout ratio. 
oh my goodness, what a jerk I am, right? I, I won't do it. So here we go. We're going to say, what if I have net income divided by net income? I've basically just taken this formula, net income is equal to dividends plus addition to retained earnings. And all I've done is divided everything by net income. And when I do that, this thing becomes 1. And so the next thing I'm going to tell you is that the retention ratio is also 1 minus the dividend payout ratio. Let me say that one more time. Actually, I'll say it two more times. The uh, additional, oh, sorry, the retention, <laughs> retention ratio is 1 minus the dividend payout ratio. The retention ratio is 1 minus the dividend payout ratio. Now, you need to, by the way, success in solving finance problems, a lot of people want to jump straight to the math. But the key to success is reading, right? You need to read to see what I've given you. If I've given you the addition to, if I've given you the retention ratio, no problem. That's just B. If I give you a dividend payout ratio, one minus that gives you B. Okay, now, I throw it into the formula, and on the top I have ROA times B, and on the bottom I have one minus ROA times B. And when I solve that, I'm going to come out with a decimal that I can then multiply by 100% to get it to be in a percentage. So this is the internal growth rate. If this is, comes out to be 10%, that means that I can grow my assets by 10% on internal equity alone. I don't have to issue any additional stock. I don't have to go out and borrow any money. Okay, now let's see how that relates to the sustainable growth rate. That formula sure looks familiar. It looks identical to the internal growth rate with one difference. What's the difference? Yeah, it's ROE instead of ROA. And remember, we said last time that ROE is equal to ROA times the equity multiplier. And that equity multiplier is total assets divided by total equity. By the way, what is the equity multiplier for an all-equity firm? It's one. And what does that mean for the relationship between ROA and ROE for an all-equity <coughs> firm? Yeah, they're the same, right? They're the same. And if ROA and ROE are the same, what does that tell us about IGR and SGR for an all-equity firm? They're going to be the same. They're going to be the same. Okay, now we can, uh, and we've already talked about that a little bit there. So let's talk about what is impacting the internal growth rate and the sustainable growth rate. Well, first of all, the profit margin. Why the profit margin? Well, remember that um, ROE, or actually ROA, <coughs> ROA is profit margin. Man, I can't write today. ROA is equal to profit <coughs> margin times total asset turnover. You guys remember that? Okay, so that's ROA. By the way, that's net income over sales, sales divided by total assets, and the sales just cancel. Okay, so if that profit margin goes up, both ROA and ROE go up, and therefore both SGR and IGR go up. Now, what about total asset turnover? Well, we see that this is a part of also ROA, which is part of ROE. So an increase in total asset turnover is going to increase both of these growth rates. Because you're using the same amount of assets to produce more sales. And then your dividend policy is going to affect both. By the way, dividend policy is deciding what percentage of my net income I'm going to pay out as dividends or how much I'm going to pay out in dividends. Which variable does that affect in that formula? Hmm. Swing and a miss. Which variable? Remember I just told you that the retention ratio was 1 minus the dividend payout ratio. 
And so if we choose to pay out more dividends, we're going to have a lower retention ratio, which is going to lead to lower growth. On the other hand, we could pay out less and have a higher retention ratio, and therefore we could grow faster. Does that make sense? And in fact, the retention ratio for new firms, how much do you think new firms retain of their net income? Ooh, no, no, they retain nearly all of it, right? They don't pay out dividends. In fact, the life cycle of a company looks like this. When a company's new, it's got lots of growth opportunities, more than it can finance on its own, right? So they go out and they sell shares and they borrow money. And so if you're out there selling shares and borrowing money, should you be paying out a dividend? No, you want to preserve that for that internal equity. Remember we said internal equity is cheaper because you don't have to pay flotation costs. So no one expects a new high growth company to pay dividends. But just like people, hopefully, uh, companies mature, right? You're gonna get to a point where there aren't that many growth opportunities and eventually your net income will more than meet your needs for additional equity. At that point, that's when you start paying out dividends, right? Uh, just like the human body. And, you know, if you think about how much a baby grows in the first year, they go from roughly, and I'm going to use an American baby here, they're pretty big, but here we go. They go from about 8 pounds to 16 pounds or so in the first year. That's like a 100% increase. Do you think that the child continues to grow at 100% through its entire life? Oh, hopefully not, right? Because the your person, by the time they were 13, would fill this room. Does that make sense? And so just like uh, infants, companies, the percentage growth is going to taper off. And it always cracks me up when I hear people say, oh yeah, they're going to grow at 30% forever. No, no. Eventually, every man, woman, and child in this country, or in the world, will have a battery-powered scooter. And the additional number of battery-powered scooters will not continue to increase at 100% per year. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, then finally, we have the financial policy, which is the capital structure. That's this little piece right here. The equity multiplier is where your capital structure is, is located in this equation. And that's only impacting your ROE. It's not impacting your ROA. And so therefore, it's only affecting your sustainable growth rate. And the higher your debt to equity ratio is, the higher your ROE will be, and the higher your sustainable growth rate will be. And it's easy to see why. If my debt to equity ratio is one, for every dollar of additional equity, internal equity, I can borrow one dollar. But what if my debt to equity ratio is three? That means for every additional dollar of internal equity, I can go out and borrow three dollars, right? And so I could be growing at four instead of growing at two with a debt to equity ratio of one, or just one if I'm only using my internal equity, which would be the, or the internal growth rate. Questions? Okay, now <clears throat> I'm telling you, work through this stuff, especially the sustainable growth rate and the internal growth rate. Remember that I may give you the dividend payout ratio instead of the retention ratio. Uh, have the words payback ratio and retention ratio on your note sheet so you'll know you'll know that they are the same thing. <coughs> Questions? Um, that, that whole part confused me with the retention ratio and plot, plowback ratio. So if you if you give the retention ratio the plowback ratio, um, then it's just the formula for B. Yeah, so B is retention ratio, plowback ratio. Correct. If I give you a dividend payout ratio, what do you do? Then it's one minus. Yep. One minus the dividend payout ratio gives you the plowback ratio. Good question. Other questions? 